winter advance. I've been waiting all fall to get to the winter advance. How many people, this is their first ever advance? This is your first one? Yes. Yeah. This is, this is good. I, uh, I've been around since the very first advance. I don't know how many advances we've had. Let me think here. Maybe 30, maybe. Yeah. I'm looking at Jason. Jason doesn't know. He's a mathematician. He doesn't know. Hmm? Um, I'm really excited. I think the... I think just the time of year excites me. Uh, this particularly is my favorite winter of all time. Uh, I'm not a snow person. Uh, if, who's a skier in the room? Like you're a skier? That's you? I'm really sorry. I'm pretty sure God heard my prayers and at your expense. Uh, I'm, I'm living the dream. This, this is my favorite winter. Um, also, every January something amazing happens. Uh, they put this little show on Fox every year called American Idol. Um, any American Idol fans? You can you can boo me out of here if you want. But any fans? Like seriously, just you guys and me. We're it. Seriously, no one else likes American Idol. Um, here's the thing. I tell you what I like about it. I I lose. I get bored with it once it gets to the stages where everyone's together. It's the beginning that gets me going. Like I love the beginning of American Idol and. The, the part where you start to see all these people come up and you're like, okay, that could be the person. No, that could be the person. Thanks, Jason. No, that could be the person. That could be the person. Um, but my favorite part are the people who are delusional. You know what I mean? They get up there and they sing their heart out. And like there's a story ahead of time. And so they're, you know, the, the camera's on them. They're telling the story. This person's from a small town in Iowa. Made it all the way out here. And their parents had to sacrifice you know, their, their whole livestock, you know, and, and they send them, you know, whatever. And then they get there and they get and the music's on them and the sound's on them. And they're in front of the, the judges and they just sound incredibly awful. Like that, that I love. And then the judges tell them, they, the judges say, you, you should never sing. Um, who told you you could sing? My grandmother told me I could sing. Well, your grandmother lied to you. You should not sing. And then that's not the best part. The best part is when they leave and they go, American Idol sucks. They've, they've passed up on the best thing. It's not over. I'll show them. Those are my people. I love those people. I was thinking about that because I was thinking, is it possible that everyone has a moment in their life where they, I can, I, they can identify with that person? Where they realize they've been lying to themselves or they've been a little bit delusional. Have you ever had a moment like that? A moment where you came to that point where you're like, what I thought my life was, what I believed about life, what I centered my life around is absolutely not true. This is what's true. This is what I believed. This is what's true. And then you're caught right in the middle of that and you go, aren't I the idiot? Have you ever had that moment in your life? I've had that moment. I've had several of those moments. In fact, I've probably had too many of those moments. Um, the first time I remember ever having the moment, I was about 21 years old. Actually, I was 21. And um, I had fallen in love. Uh, many of you guys know this. I've sh- shared this story with you, but I'm going to share it again just from this viewpoint. Um, I met a girl when I was 16, and I was from a very big family, six kids. I'm the youngest of six. Anybody in here family of more than six kids? Megan Yost included? Okay. Yeah. Anybody six kids or more? Let me explain. So like maybe a few of us, you're going to know what I'm talking about here. Hurting. You are herded. So you feel love from the parents, but you're kind of like, it's in a group thing, you know? Your parents do connect to you, but in my family, my parents kind of, they loved us, but I never sensed love direct because we were grouped together all the time. And now that I'm a dad and I have kids, I understand this. They're just, kids are going everywhere. And I cannot imagine my parents with six kids. But when I found love for the first time, I was like a real dry sponge, man. And I like ate it up. I'm like, this is the greatest feeling in the whole world to feel loved by someone. They're reciprocating, their affection, all that. I just like a sponge. It just soaked up. And man, I dove in with both feet and I wrapped my life around this love. So, you know, all my senior year of high school and two years after that, and then one, a month short of my uh, 20th birthday, 
I stood up and made vows together and in front of family and friends and committed my life to this person. And I'm thinking, this is the greatest day, and everything is great, and this is my life. And then less than a year later, the person decided not to hang out with me anymore. That would be the nicest way I can say that. Um, and when, when you're in that situation, if you've ever had the carpet pulled out from under you, you ask a lot of questions. You ask God questions. You ask people questions. You ask, if you can, you ask direct questions to people. You, you, but you start to come up with this, what, what is going on here? And I'll never forget realizing that that person had basically decided to skip me and went straight to another person. And I was just floored by that. And then I started realizing that this wasn't a new thing. This actually had been happening over the course of our four years together. And this is what I came to the conclusion. What I believed about life, what I believed I had wrapped my life around, was absolutely not true. I had been living a lie. The facts were these. And they were very tough facts for me to deal with. They were uh, life-changing, uh, altering things. And I wouldn't be here today if God hadn't met me in, those, in that reality. But I thought this is what was true. Have you ever had a moment like that? Maybe not to that extreme, or maybe in something else, where you realize that you actually are living a lie. I bring that up because Jason brought up some really interesting things last Sunday night when he was talking about worship. He, he basically said this, if you are alive, you're a worshiper. To be alive is to be a worshiper. You were made to worship. The Bible says this in John chapter 4. This is an incredible conversation that Jesus has. and um, I'm just going to be in one verse here, and then we're going to go back to Romans chapter 1. That's where we're going to be tonight. Uh, but in John chapter 4, there's this encounter that Jesus has with this woman at a well. And this woman, he met her right where she was at. She had all kinds of baggage in her life, and he just met her right there, talked her through a lot of things, and then she brings up the idea of worship. And Jesus responds to her with this statement in John chapter 4. Verse 24, or verse 23, it says this. In John 4, 23, it says, Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and, has worship, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the question that you have to ask yourself in that is, am I a true worshiper? What Jason was saying is, if you are alive, you are made to worship, and the Father seeks people who worship in spirit and truth, then we have to ask ourselves, are we a true worshiper? Because what if we might be the delusional ones here? We might be kidding ourselves, we might be selling ourselves, and we might believe facts about what we're offering to God with our lives that actually aren't true at all. And that would be a very difficult set of realities to come to grips with today. And I'm going to have to gloss over something here. And when it says to worship in spirit, I'm assuming most of you understand that. But let me just say that that basically is the centerpiece of the gospel. That God made us to know him. That we are separate from him because of the sin in our life. And then God sent his son down here to die on the cross to reconcile us back. And that when we come to grips with that, when we realize that, we say, okay, I get that. I'm offering you my life. I surrender to you. Please forgive me. And somewhere in that moment, something magical happens. God puts his spirit in you. That's what it means to be called born again. You receive the spirit. So you must worship the Father in spirit. And unless you have the spirit of God in you, you are not a worshiper of God. That is first and foremost the primary uh, essence of what it means to be a worshiper of God. But what about... People who have received the Spirit of God, are we still worshiping in truth? And so I want to look at a passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 1 that I think really speaks to this. It's alarming. It's exciting. Um, it's fantastic. It's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, and I hope that what you'll see in it um, will revolutionize your life. I think there's three things I'm going to say about it, and I could preach about Romans chapter 1 for the next six weeks and not get to the core of it. But I'll do everything I can. I promise you I will preach with everything I have tonight to share it with you. But if God speaks to you in these moments, it'll be amazing. So let me pray that somehow God will make himself evident in this passage and in your life even right now, okay?
So as, as I'm praying, I want you praying for yourself that God will speak to you, okay? Let's do that together. God, I ask, and um, I love what Christina asked for, that we would beg that you would come meet with us. Um, and that's what I'm asking, God, that you would come and speak, that you would speak to me even in this, um, that you would speak to the people here, that you would um, revolutionize our life, that we would see the reality of what it means to be a true worshiper. And Lord, I trust you, and I trust in your spirit that you'll be here in this. In your son's holy name, amen. Amen. All right. In Romans chapter 1, I'm going to say three things. The first one is this, is that most people are living a lie. In the history of the world, in all the generations, in the 6.8 billion people that are here on the earth today, most people are living a lie. And as you see this in this passage, I'm going to kind of lay it out. And uh, in chapter 1, verse 16 through the end of the chapter, I'm going to read through it. Here's what I want you to do, because I need your help in this. There's too many people. I can't have a one-on-one conversation with everyone in this room. But what I want you to do is, as I'm reading this, I'm going to comment a little bit on it. But I want you to maybe underline in your Bible or highlight in your Bible every time you see something that, that strikes you as interesting. Anything that you see. And if, if you're like, you can't write in your Bible. Listen, it's on Ed's head now, okay? I've given you permission. And if somewhere we've broken some rule that you can't write in your Bible, then it's on my head. It's okay. You can do that. So if you've never done that, today's your first day. That's okay. If you're borrowing someone else's Bible, tell them that Ed said so. It's going to be fine. But I want you to think, I want you to underline or highlight something in there as I'm going through the passage that you find interesting. And here's what I want you to focus on. Most people who ever lived are living a lie. As I'm going through this, I want you to see this. Here's what it says in verse 16. Paul writing to this church in Rome, and Jason mentioned last Sunday night about this church was a, a church that's in Rome. He's never been to this church yet. Um, through some dramatic circumstances, the church was highly Jewish at the start and now has become dominantly Gentile converts. So all the Jews have been kicked out of Rome, and so this is kind of a huge transition for the church. And Paul's writing this letter to correct them, to change them, to encourage them. And here's what it says. Remember, he's speaking to a church, and here's what he starts out with. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So God is revealing his righteousness in this first section through the gospel. He's showing you who he is. The next verse says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Here's what godlessness means. I read this and I think instantly immorality. People who are doing awful things, they're you know just bad people. That's not what this, verse, this word actually means. The word actually means someone who basically disregards God as important. This could be a very moral person, a very religious person. It could be a person who, like, you know, is on the city council. It doesn't matter who it is. It could be your professor. It could be you in this room. But it doesn't mean someone who's immoral. It means someone who disregards God. Next verse is this. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. These people were fools because they... God is basically saying here, you know who I am. Everyone in this room knows that there is a God. You may try to suppress that truth, you may not even believe that truth, But it's foolish to believe that because everyone actually knows there's a God. That's what God's saying. Next verse, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds, animals, and reptiles. Ancient civilizations all the way up till today are making idols of things that don't look like God and making them to be God, which is foolish. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. I want you to note something here, just for you theologian people who like to argue points. You see here that the human responsibility is they exchanged. They were foolish. And then you see, and then God gave them over. You see the responsibility of man and you see the sovereignty of God right here in like one, like four words apart. Isn't that amazing? 
Next thing it says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. And there it is, a spontaneous burst of praise by Paul. And here's what happens now as a result of this exchange. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way that men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another, men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness. And now as I read this list, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about the things on this list that are actually true of you at one time or another. Because I hate this list, by the way. It says they are full of envy. I'm sorry, I messed up. Yeah, envy, greed, depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. I love how that's in there with God-haters. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless, and although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they do not only, or they, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of these practices in others. It's interesting that what God is saying here is that he's revealing himself and making himself known by his creation. On top of that, he's putting his uh, consciousness into their hearts so they would know that they're doing wrong. And there's an exchange of worship that's taking place. This whole passage, there's an exchange of worship that's taking place. They're exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And they're setting the lie up as God and they're worshiping the lie. They're living a lie. This, it's interesting the things that we see even at OSU probably that, you know, there's a, a vast majority of people that are trying to take God out of creation, right? That somehow if we can just get God out of creation, then, then we'd be okay. We don't have to deal with their God. Isn't that interesting? The very thing that God has done to prove himself to us, and yet we try to get him out. There's two two books I read since January 1st. I'm I'm actually reading three. One is a lot tougher. It's a Brennan Manning book, and I'm just just soaking it in. But I read two autobiographies. I'm kind of a sports nut. Um, I can't help it. It's the way I was born. Uh, What are you going to do? I I, I love Tim Tebow. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I got Tim. Oh, I was given Tim Tebow's autobiography by my wife for Christmas. Um, thank you, Brandon, for taking care of that for us. And uh, it, it's incredible. You have this guy who's athletically gifted. He grows up, so he's the centerpiece of his whole community, right? You know that kid, the star athlete? Imagine you're Tim Tebow, so you're the best in every sport from the time you're little until you're big. And this is what you see in his autobiography. He li- literally realizes that God is God and that he's part of creation, and so he lives his whole life to try to draw attention to God. And, and you just see it all throughout his life. And this, this guy, no matter what he does, whether he has a lot of success or a lot of failure, he's just trying to point back to God. On top of that, because of who he is and because he's famous at such an early age, he has a lot of attention and a lot of opportunities for stress and uh, sin. And yet he constantly is combating that and pointing people to God. Incredible young guy. So I read another autobiography. It only took me like three days to read this because I'm fascinated with this guy because I'm a huge fan of this guy. The name is Sugar Ray Leonard. Anyone heard of Sugar Ray Leonard? You guys know? Let me tell you who he is. Um, I don't know what boxer today you guys might think of that you think is a good boxer. Because, you know, Manny Manny Pacquiao, you guys know who that is? Or Floyd Mayweather Jr.? Um, Sugar Ray Leonard captivated our whole nation. In 1976, he won the gold medal. And by the time, by 1981, he was a world champion, and he was small. But he wasn't one of those guys that was like just a tactical fighter, and he wasn't a huge power guy. He was both, and he was unbelievable. And, you know, he was just, I wanted to be Sugar Ray Leonard. And so I read this guy's autobiography. Now, at this point in his life, he's 54 years old, and he's looking back at his life and telling the story from the eyes of the 54-year-old Sugar Ray Leonard, not the 22-year-old Sugar Ray Leonard. And this is what he's done. Because he's athletically gifted from the time he's little all the way up, he becomes the centerpiece of his community. 
And so he took advantage of that uh, fame. And he took every ounce of advantage of it. If, that, if I'm making myself clear. If, let me just point it this way. He got, you know, he cheated on his wife so many times that his own sons called him a machine. That they, they couldn't even fathom what their father was like. He's t- saying, and these are his words, well, what guy could turn it down? He had people all over the country that he would meet with. Let's say it that way. Um, on top of that, he ruined relationship after relationship after relationship. He used people. He used his fame in order to basically make himself godlike. And now, he, he, you know, as a result of this life, he ended up ruining all these relationships. Now he, he realized he's an addict, he's a, a, an alcoholic, and he's ruined all these relationships. He's ruined a relationship with his ex, he's ruined a relationship with his children, and he's just ashamed of himself. And I say that because I've read both these autobiographies in the last four weeks, and I'm thinking, here are two guys, both athletically gifted, who raised raised up in this idea that they are the centerpiece of all attention. One deflects the attention to God, the other takes it all for himself, and he's just miserable and one is full of joy. We can see it's very easy, and it's easy to understand that the majority of people are living a lie. The majority of people have creation as a centerpiece, and what I mean by that is themselves. And they get the result of that. And maybe, uh, you know, you're thinking, okay, well, well, sure, I understand it because I used to be like that, Ed. But I'm changed now. I follow Jesus. And, you know, I spent part of my life living out just for me. And now I realize the, through the cross who Jesus is. And I'm, I don't have that problem anymore. But uh, that may not be true. The second thing I want to say is that uh, it's very possible that everyone in this room who calls himself a believer may be living a lie right now. It is very possible. I can honestly say that I have been confronted by this, and God has made it absolutely clear to me that there have been times I've been living a lie. I've been doing exactly what it says in verse 25. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him or gave thanks. This is 23. Gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And skip down to 25. It says this. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Let me give you four ways that God has made it real to me that I've struggled with. And I can't say what's for you, but let me show you how God has shown me That I have put something else in place of God. And remember what Jason said. If you weren't there last Sunday, he said, it's one of the keys is to understand what the object of worship is. The object is either God or we put something else as the object of worship. Here's how God has shown me these four statements in my life that I have thought and even said out of my mouth that God has shown me that I have literally been living a lie. Here's the first one. I've gone to worship services where I say, man... That worship service stunk. The band sucked. The uh, preacher was awful. I didn't like the songs they did. I didn't like the band. I didn't like that person's voice. That's the first thing. Number two. I don't feel close to God right now. I feel distant from God. I don't feel loved by God. I don't feel the joy that I want from God. I don't feel like God's answering my prayers. I don't feel close to God. Second thing. Third thing. God, I feel so close to you when I am obedient. When I'm going to church. When I'm doing my quiet times. You know, those times when you get together with God one-on-one and you read with Him and you pray with Him and, you know, that time. Like, I'm doing that. I'm being obedient. I'm sharing my faith on a regular basis. I'm showing up on a regular basis. I'm doing, leading my Bible studies. And God, I feel so close to you when I have that with you. That's number three. Number four. God, I don't feel close to you at all when I'm not being obedient. When I'm not, man, I missed like five quiet times this week. I'm not reading my Bible. I haven't prayed in I don't know how long. And those sins I've been avoiding, 
they've crept back in. I don't feel close to you, God. What's the commonality in all those statements? Anybody? Thanks for shouting that out. I appreciate that. It doesn't make me feel any better. I. You ever said anything like that? This is what God has shown me. Somewhere in my relationship with God, I put myself up and I, I determine my worship based on me rather than God. Now, I can't tell you what your deal is, but one of the things that um, you know, Jason said, he was bringing up this verse in, uh, in um, I, I don't have it with me, it's Psalm 115. And here's what's going on in Psalm 115. That basically God is saying, listen, you guys, you carve your idols and they can't speak. They have feet, but they can't walk. They have throats, and they can make no noise. And those who worship them will become just like them. And the idea that God's getting across is that we are going to become like what we worship. We will become like what we worship. That means we will start to value the same things as the object of our worship. So here's what I will say to you. I know what God has told me about lies that I've been living. But for you, if you are starting to value things that aren't of God, and you're starting to get frustrated and angry and you feel distant, you're starting to have less value for others, less value for things that are good, and if you kind of care less about the gospel, it's not that important to you, it's possible that somewhere in this world that's steeped with sin, your heart has started to gravitate and somewhere worship has been replaced and the result of that is that your heart's starting to value things that aren't of God at all. Guilty. It's an awful thing. And I think the root of this is found in Ezekiel 28. Let me just read this to you, and let me give you the context. What's happening is, in Ezekiel 28, um, the, the prophet Ezekiel is, is sharing a message from God to all these kings and nations who have oppressed Israel. And he gets to the kingdom of Tyre, and he's like, this king is just like Satan. He has the exact same sin as Satan. And he starts describing Satan. And in verse 17, this is what he says about Satan after explaining how he made Satan to be the most beautiful angel there ever was. Here's what he says in verse 17. He says, your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. This is the deal. When we put created things up and we start to center our lives around them, basically what we're doing is we're having pride rise up in us. Pride is the great evil within us that rises, that replaces God. That brings us me to the last thing that I want to share from this passage. And it really comes down to this, that you and I need to learn to live in the truth. Because if you're like me and you've looked in the mirror and you've had God speaking to you and you realize, oh my, I have worshipped created things rather than the creator, then you've got to deal with the truth because the truth will actually set you free. Right? John 8. So the question is then, how do we get that? And before I get there, what, what you've got to see is that God is revealing himself in this passage in dramatic ways. I'm only going to give you four. But I want you to see as I reveal them, or as I share them with you, that God is revealing something of his heart. Okay? Before I do that, I want you to know that it's easy to pick up on this. Okay? I'm going to reveal something to you guys tonight about me that I think you're going to be able to understand what my heart is about. Okay? I have a video of something that is probably the single most precious video I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm not saying that to build it up. It is the most impressive, most beautiful um, most amazing video I've ever seen, ever. It's, it holds the most incredible talent, incredible beauty that you're ever going to see. Ever. Mark my words on this, okay? So I want you to, to look at it and understand that you're watching the most beautiful thing you'll ever see outside of God himself, but this is part of creation, so you're going to see that God can show something of you, something of himself through this too. But this is my heart to you guys. This is what I love more than anything in the whole world outside of my king. Nifty, nifty, large seeds from 13 original colonies. Shell, I mean, nifty, nifty, stars in the flag that billows appear to play in the breeze. Each 
Pitch of 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 each individual day deserves a bow. We salute them now. Fifty nifty United States from thirteen original colonies. Count count 'em, tell all about 'em, one by one, till we've given a day to every state in the USA. Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico. New York, North Carolina, North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, Washington, West Virginia, Wisconsin, Wyoming, North, South, East, West, and claim objective opinion. We, Ohio is the best of the 50 nifty United States from 13 original colonies. Shout them, scout them, tell all about them, one by one, till we've given a day to every state in the good old year. You better not be laughing at my daughters. I will kick all your. We're videoing this, right? It's my video. Um, what you didn't know, Carly was practicing different octaves. <laughs> all right. So what does this say about me? If this is what I love most, what does this say about me? I love American Idol. <laughs> starting them early, Jeremy. I'm starting them early. What else? What does this say about me? What does this reveal about me if I say this is the most amazing thing ever? I'm a dad. I love my family. It's pretty simple, isn't it? So you can deduce something about me by something I reveal, right? All right, so let's deduce something about God, by the truth of God, but not just the information of what he's revealing, but can we get the heart of God in what he's revealing? Go to uh, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. God is revealing the power of who he is through creation. So you you kind of forced to do one of two things. You can look at creation and you can say, look how awesome I have it by getting all this creation for myself. Or you can look at creation and become fascinated by the creator. I have seen some amazing sights. There is nothing like holding a newborn baby in the whole world, right? I mean, you they put that baby in your arms and you're like, oh my. And you don't do, wow, I am so awesome. Look what I made. You don't do that. You go... Who are you? When you see, I mean, I love being up in a plane and being able to look down. I love, you know, the ocean. I love all these things about creation, but I'm fascinated by the creator because of what he's done. And when I look at creation, I see the thumbprint of our God. What does that say about his power and his majesty? The second one is this, verse 17. It says, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is being revealed. A righteousness is being revealed. That you see something about God. All of us know what is right and what is wrong. We are above the animals. When God made us, he made us in his image. We know what righteousness is. But when we start to see the gospel, we realize there's a completely different level to righteousness. And this is what I was thinking about this week. God was showing me this week. I believe God loves more good to a higher degree than you and I could ever fathom. You and I love what we believe is good. But what I believe is he loves what is good to an nth degree. When he made creation in Genesis, what did he say? It is good. Why did he say that? Every time he made this, and then he made Adam, he's like, 
well, that's good. Made Eve, that's good too. Made land, made sea, made all this stuff. And he goes, that's good. Why do you say that? Because it reveals something about him and what he values. He made the world to do exactly what it's supposed to do, to point back to him. My friend, my theologian friend, we'll call him the, the great McDonald, said, we're the only ones who have messed this up. We're the only ones inside creation that are really messing it up. God's wrath, verse 18, here's what it says. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men. The wrath of God. What does this say about the heart of God? And this is where it gets kind of dicey. Because, this is what I've known about many people, we really like the idea of a loving God, right? And we all want the benefits of a loving God, don't we? But how do you reconcile the wrath of God with the love of God? And what I've been thinking about this week is if God loves something that so passionately, wouldn't it make sense that what he hates, what is evil, would he would hate it to a higher degree than we do? If you love something so much and there's evil, wouldn't you hate that even more than you and I could understand? I'll give you an example just so you can understand what I'm trying to say here. So Abby, my, the one on the left, seven-year-old, she, and last year, she was in kindergarten. We take her to school, and there's a girl in the neighborhood. Her name is Kennedy. Super kid. She's in sixth grade last year. And, you know, we would see her out, and we would talk to her and whatnot. And, you know, she would always pay attention to Abby. Well, last year in the halls, when Abby would go down the hall, Kennedy would see her, and she'd be like, hi, Abby. And once in a while, she would take Abby down to her class. And Abby, she would come home and say, I talked to Kennedy the whole day. And she was just so, and I don't know why little girls love older girls, but they do. They just look up to them, right? I'm sure, you know, us guys, we do that too. Well, and, and they had this little thing where they ran around the track and they raised money running around the track. And, and all the kinder, kindergartners got paired up with a sixth grader to be their encourager. And Kennedy got Abby. Kennedy picked Abby. And literally, I watched as she ran around each track and Kennedy was there. You go, Abby. You can do it. It was so amazing to watch. Well, she's in seventh grade now and she's changing. Kennedy's not the same as she was last year. And uh, we were outside and Kennedy comes walking down the street with a couple of boys. And Abby said, hi, Kennedy, hi, Kennedy. And Kennedy walked right past. And Abby looked at me. She says, I guess she didn't hear me. Now, I'm not an idiot. I get that. I, know, I mean, I get that. But let's fast forward, my little girls, about 15 years. And let's say they're in this room tonight. 22, 20, typical young girls, how many of you girls would consider dismissing them out of your life? How do you think I would feel about it? I told you what I love most. How would you feel? How, would you want me to tolerate that? How many of you girls would talk bad about them behind their back? How many of you would gossip about them? How many of you would say mean things about them? How many of you would go out of their way to kind of undermine them? How many of you would make fun of them? Have you ever done that to anybody? How would you think I would feel about that? Fellas, fantasize about my daughters? Take advantage of my daughters? How do you think I'd feel? Just put yourself in my shoes for a minute. How do you think I would feel? As a dad, you know what I value most. You see, when you value something so much that you love, then you cannot get rid of the rage that comes inside when you see evil. We can all understand that, right? But we want a tolerant God. God is not a tolerant God. He's not tolerant. He is a angry, wrath-filled God at times. And God is revealing, what does it say about His heart? And when I look in the mirror, here's the deal. I've been... Many of the things on the list. I've done, oh, I don't even want to talk about it right now. I've done things that I know I feel ashamed of. What does he feel? And this is, brings me to the last thing. And this is the reason I worship God with all my heart. And I hate sin in my life. I hate it when I don't put him in his rightful place. I hate it that somehow my worship seems less than he deserves. Because of this last revelation, and it comes in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first the Jew and then the Gentile. The gospel 
is a revelation of the love and mercy and grace of God. You see, I've been thinking about this idea of wrath this week because I've been studying this and I'm thinking about God with all of that wrath filled up. And we want him to sweep it under the rug. We want him just to be cool with us, right? But then I see the wrath coming like a torrent, like a volcano that with all its fury and all of its might, you know, and then we think, where's Jesus in all this, right? You know, sometimes we get this idea of Jesus being this like really weak, wimpy white dude, you know, and he's just begging people to accept him. Oh, please accept me with your love. Please accept me with your love. You're like, that's not Jesus. What I see is a Jesus who stands up to the torrent of God and says, here's the deal. I'll step in front of all of that wrath, every ounce of it, and I will block everyone behind me, and I'll absorb it myself. As they nail his hands to the tree and literally takes it for all of us. There is nothing feminine, nothing wimpy, nothing lame about Jesus Christ. And I was thinking tonight as we were singing, I was trying to imagine... Him taking the full wrath of God and then looking at me and going, Daddy, forgive Ed, because he doesn't know what he's doing. The love in his eyes. Who does that? Who takes the full brunt of the wrath of God to reveal at the same moment the love and the grace and mercy? And this is why I cannot escape worshiping God as the object. And when... When I see that, I'm forced to an inevitable problem. That when God shows me that I've been living a lie, and he shows me the facts, I can either be proud and make excuses, I can blame shift, I can uh, try to explain my way out of it, or I can just kind of keep my head in the sand. Those are all possibilities for me, to not deal with it, But somewhere, if God puts any humility in me, what I can do is I can say, God, you're right. I'm not the centerpiece of worship. It's not about my feelings. It's not about what I want. I actually belong to you. I'm part of creation, and I'm yours, and my job is to reflect your beauty. I want to worship you. And for some reason, for some reason, God loves that. He should wipe me out. And Jesus never should have taken the brunt of the wrath from me. And that's why I worship him. And I need that truth in my life, and that's what sets me free of myself. I don't need that lie. I need the truth. I share that with you, and I want you to know that we're on a journey this weekend to understand what true worship really is. And if you're here and you've never understood what it really means that there's a real savior, savior who took the brunt of the wrath. Maybe your religion has been you're going to earn up. You're going to go and do this thing and you're going to you know, be a good person. You're going to clean your life up and you're going to, oh, God wants me to act this way. People, you know, if that's what your religion has been. Well, that's not a savior. A savior is Jesus who takes the brunt of wrath. And what he wants from us is to submit our life to him. And that's the first thing that you do in humility. Say, God, I will give you my life. And for you, maybe that's your step tonight. If you're in this room and maybe God is showing, yeah, you've got some areas of your life that are not lining up with reality. Somewhere, by being steeped in this world, you've allowed your heart to get caught up in the values of this world. And somewhere you've replaced the object of worship. and You've kind of made it up there onto that podium. And for you, the idea is to go to God and say, God, show it to me with your honesty. God, show me the full length of my sin. Show me, and then God, help me to deal with that. Would you be willing to admit it's a possibility? And would you be willing to ask God this weekend, God, if it's true, would you show me? Would you guys consider that? Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for us, and I want you to think through with God if you're willing to take that on and talk to him. I think the band's going to come up and play again, and uh, the band, uh, Jason and Christina, will give us direction as to where we're going from here tonight, and um, then we're going to be done, okay? Okay.
Lord, I thank you so much for being a God who is willing to reveal himself. And that for whatever reason, you choose to love us, even when we disregard who you are, we suppress the truth, we exchange it, and we worship things that don't matter. And frankly, God, I know in my heart, sometimes I would rather be the object of worship. And that is offensive to you, and it's actually offensive to the Spirit in you. I'm asking God that you would show me any cracks in my life that aren't true. God, that you would make me into a true worshiper, not because I'm going to get some benefit, because someday someone would might look at me and see you. That's what I want, God, because that's what you deserve. I'm praying, God, in this room, that all of us would be on this journey and where you're having your way with us, that you would reveal to us your truth and you would make us true worshipers, whether it's at the beginning stages and coming to you for the first time or whether it's something you're showing us that we've never realized ever. Make us into true worshipers, God. By your son's holy name, by your grace, God, we rest in that. Amen.